Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sonic League show with uh, your host, Sean Bond. And today we have a magnificent guest uh, known as Douglas Dietrich. He is a scholar and a uh, um, he used to work for the uh, military document disposal aspect for the Presidial military base. Yes. And uh, <laughs> he is well versed in the cult and uh, secret knowledge and hidden uh, truths and the history that has been destroyed by uh, bureaucracy uh, and replaced with uh, false truths to paint a picture of like, oh, oh, it's all sunny and just trust us kind of thing. Uh, and uh, he's now uh, bringing that out and uh, like kind of a whistle blowing it, but like, you know, in a more expanded way because he is also uh, fairly photographic in his memory. And uh, uh, he brings out such gifts and uh, knowledge to this world. Uh, thank you and uh, show your love in the comments. Can you add a little bit more to that introduction? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, definitely. And I want to thank you that introduction introduction is very gracious and it's very graceful i think that uh what uh we can do is uh just kind of go along organically with everything uh obviously document disposal is uh, a little bit less dignified than document destruction uh but uh i will say this much the uh i worked the incinerator Sitch. at the presidio uh, i'm sorry Incineration is uh, yes, a nice yes, thing. yes. Like I worked uh, the incinerator at the Presidio military base and uh, uh, destroyed uh, an enormous number of documents. Uh, our man, uh, Mr. Sean Bond, says that uh, I have a fairly photographic memory because I did a lot to destroy that uh, photographic memory as much as possible in order to. Well, it's not a gift; it's a curse, and uh, it really contributes symptomatically to complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So. Uh, one of the things that helped me, of course, was my psychiatrist, Dr. Tao Tran, who was magnificent in terms of using uh, highly advanced uh, regressive and also, um, in a sense, suggestive uh, hypnotherapy. Uh, there was a lot of uh, deep hypnosis that was uh, conducted so that I could compartmentalize a lot of the experiences that were uh, providing me particular pain and um, uh, along with that and a lot of basically narcotization, a lot of drinking and drug abuse, I've managed to do some damage quite intentionally to my once photographic memory. Uh, however, uh, that being said, uh, <laughs> I noticed that there's this protective uh, uh, gesture uh, that... Uh, that's uh and i i take that as almost a healing gesture i, I take it uh protective and uh compassionate and uh he, at any rate uh, that having been done um I, I still remember quite a bit and uh we'll uh go into those memories uh, not necessarily of all the painful things that happened at the presidio or otherwise in my life but certainly We'll talk about uh, basically my trying to overcome cultural genocide, which is what documents destruction really is. It's a form of cultural genocide. Uh, and we'll do that today by going into some fairly uh, deep topics, uh, dark topics, or at least uh, at least uh, topics that get uh, dismissed quite a bit. Um, and uh, with that having been said, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Sean Bond take over again. Yeah, and uh, this uh, like uh, warning to people uh, in the love and light community: uh, it, uh, if you're easily triggered and not uh, very able to handle dark topics and dark truths easily, this show not, might not be for you. Uh, though, uh, if you're wanting to be brave and doing this, uh, go ahead and hug yourself and uh, cultivate love and loving detachment to a lot of these subjects because they are uh, quite uh, overwhelming. And uh, um, you know, hug it and transmute it down and uh, get to release the fear because uh, it fear holds us back, and we we. Uh, we need to br this needs this kind of stuff needs to be brought out to the world because it's how we uh, stop uh, more suffering from existing dark truths is like, uh, oh, there's a parasite on you. And then there's like, what are you talking about? I don't believe in parasites. And, and 
uh, the, it, they once they move if only once a person can accept that dark truth is real and they can move past and they can do the thing that it takes to resolve it so that they don't suffer and, and they can remove that out of this reality making it better so uh, not saying that we can do that in general for all the the things we're going to be bringing that up but we can at least work towards that in like some interesting uh psychological uh back and forth and uh yes so my, in my background uh i uh i'm uh, uh I'm very i used to be very skeptical of a lot of this stuff and then a huge amount of spiritual stuff happened to me that threw me into a uh not um having the option to not believe it with uh, uh, demons and uh, forced possession and then learning how to depossess myself and uh, also depossess others and uh, healing and uh, healing pain and releasing over a, a distance and uh, resi uh, resolving targeted individuals and a lot of other stuff, tracking back DNA. So I, I came across these uh, things that we're going to talk about, um, such as vampirism. And uh, I, I, you know, it was interesting at the time and I kept uh, getting more data on it uh, when I tracked back in the DNA and it kind of, uh, I, I got stopped a little bit from being public about it because I didn't want to create fear about it. And I wasn't, sh you know, I'm not like an arbor of truth, so I don't want to, you know, like make something uh, that will bring more fear or whatever, because I, I don't particularly believe that just because we believe something it's going to manifest that it, it like takes the whole collective and a lot of uh, other stuff in the background that is happening but uh yeah um, we have a really grounded perspective here in uh reality and history so uh maybe he can help bring a lot of this uh awareness to grounding and i'm not trying to project anything so uh you know uh, let me know what you think on any of the th things I also bring uh, up in our back and forth. Um, I think so I, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Cool. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So I uh, tracked back that um, a fair, uh, like 10% of people have like dormant, uh, like um, recessant genes for vampirism uh, that have been inherited a long time ago, usually around like a, something around the fall of what our old civilization would be around Atlantis or something. There seems to be a bunch of invading forces that came uh, in around that time uh, that introduced a lot of uh, dark programming into our genetics and, and from multiple different places. And it, it, it's, got an interesting history thing including um from other realms and i, I liked in your book that uh oh by the way uh <laughs> the screen screen um let's see uh let me just product place this a little bit uh okay vamp uh v a m p h y r O L O G Y. So Vampirology uh, by Douglas Dietrich. Totally get it. Uh, it's really good. Uh, well compiled uh, awareness of uh, this topic uh, for those out there. He says he's going to make more. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, it's show, actually, yeah, we'll, I'll give you some details later. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway, I, I so like feel free to correct me and like, you know, you don't have to hold anything, hold this on, on shelves and stuff. I'm willing to, uh, you know, whatever. Then uh, I, I read there's like uh, so with the reason I like tapped into this because I was trying to figure out what were the things that were upending the balance system of Earth uh, in like why it's a pain in the ass to live here. Uh, why we're here in the first place, uh, like a lot of people incarnating to make this place better, all that. Um, so I, I read that the system of death has been up, uprooted and unbalanced. Like why? Why do the good die young? Kind of thing. Why? Why can't you earn uh, life extension in a positive way by like making this world a better place? Why is the dark uh, stealing a lot of authority for this? And I, I found that they they are uh, through a bunch of invasions they stole a bunch of authority and devoured a bunch of 
authority holders and uh, uh, founding species, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, the death authority is interesting because when I was reading what causes death, it seems like there's a buildup of a type of energy when a person's about to die that I just call death energy. And uh, the dark system likes to summon demons uh, and uh, do deals with them to get this death energy that they're naturally producing if they're doing really dark things to where they need to be rejected uh, or ejected from this game. And they're putting that onto the populace to get it off of them, and including sickness and suffering and other other types of things that would be accumulated in natural law. So there's these things that are distributing their suffering to those that don't deserve it and targeting powerful people like yourself and me that want to uh, make this world a better place and is uh, putting it onto them to stop us. Um, and, and so there's like a natural system of death that can be brought back to balance. And if it is, then... So I, I read like a few different things that were upending that, including vampires. I read that there are different types. Um, you can call them a bunch of different things, but based on the DNA lineages I've tracked back and I read um, all down for a while ago, uh, 10 types of life extension, uh, uh, types of vampire kind of things, the sanguine blood ones that you talk about, the regular people that take adrenochrome, uh, these these cannibal ones that are like um, uh, uh, it's like giants, um, she uh, vampires, life force vampires, and there's these five el different evolutionary branches of soul eating vampires. Uh, and then I, I read like sixty plus other types of energy th stealing uh, parasitic DNA lineages that are passed down to human. Um, but they don't get extension from in life by stealing these things. They just get overpowered in that type of energy. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> what can you tell us about uh, what you've, uh, what do you, since writing this book, uh, what do you believe in the origin of these type of uh, beings are? Oh, well, uh, there's so many that you brought up that that would yes, be a lot. Uh, that that would essentially be part of the story of the cosmos. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, uh, appreciate. Um, first off, let's start off with some uh, qualifiers, as our man uh, Sean Bond did. Sean Bond was uh, giving kind of a forewarning to anybody who is hypersensitive to that which is dark and negative, and uh, and of course he also qualified the fact that I am very grounded. Uh, myself and uh, I have to deal with a lot of the visceral reality of uh, hostility that's engendered by the fact that I, what I reveal is dark and negative. Uh, so do understand um, if you're in the chat room and uh, are in the comments and uh, you want to show your love, that's wonderful. Uh, and uh, do communicate with Mr. Bond if uh, we do get the inevitable, which is going to be uh, the gang stalkers and the trolls. And uh, these are the cultists of the kings of Edom, the very dark uh, and uh, anti natural natural entities that are not part of this universe. And in a sense, that leads us in uh, to try and explain um, the cosmology uh, the, in which Mr. Sean Bond works, the uh, reality that he had to contend with what almost overwhelmed himself and drew him into a very dark place uh, until he uh, encountered the dragon spirit and my very surname. Dietrich, of course, is the Germanic word for Dietrich, the dragon. And uh, that, of course, uh, is very similar to the uh, knighted title of Ladislav Sepish, which was Dietrich, or Dracula is a romanization of it, but it is actually Dietrachula, which simply meant son of the dragon. Uh, that was because his father was a sworn knight of the order of the dragon, and his father's title was simply Dietrach, or uh, Dracul, in the uh, Slavization of that uh, 
that name. And uh, so there are many ways to speak that name. Ultimately, um, it's my surname and it's the surname that I inherited from the man who raised and guided myself. Uh, when it comes to um, this kind of negativity, uh, confront the fact that if there are gang stalkers and there's trolls in uh, the commentary or the chat, uh, bring them to the attention of Mr. Bond. It will be entirely for his discretion, but honestly, I would say it would be best to simply uh, eliminate those people because uh, the, what they do is they leave comments that simply confuse people, they distract people, and they are part of the agenda of chaos and confusion. And uh, ultimately, this is what uh, the anti-gods of the cultists are attempting to sow in this universe. Understand that uh, your universe is a creation that is based on a natural order. And uh, the best way that you can uh, diagrammatically describe this is as I have done in detail through Hakabala, and that was gifted us many a, a centuries ago, millennia ago, uh, essentially by uh, the Judea culture and the Kabbalah shows the tree of life. And then it, uh, it centers on yeah. earth and goes into the tree of death, which is the mirror image of that tree. But in the center of it all, between the tree of life and death, is Malkuth, the material world, our world. And this is where all the action is. And uh, our world, despite people often denigrating it as material, as if that's a negative, uh, the reality that all of the heavens and all of the hells, uh, the Sephiroth and the Klipoth, they center on this world and have no meaning without this world. They exist so that this world exists, uh, hence the very order of creation. Uh, where these anti-gods come from is not from this tree of life or death. They are not even klepothic. Uh, klepothic would imply demons and uh, devils, and um, there is a difference. And of course, uh, it must be understood that all of that is part of the natural order. Uh, even though the tree of life represents that which comes out of the earth, the Malkuth, the material world, or our material universe, and uh, the Sephiroth ascend towards the ever finer uh, radiances of the heavens. Uh, when we go into the lower uh, vibrations, that extestinal tract uh, of uh, the husks or shells of the Klepoth, those sewers of Seth, those sewers of the uh, devils and demons and the damned, uh, they're absolutely necessary for this cosmic ecosystem to function. Our man Sean Bond brought up, of course, bad things happening to good people, essentially, when he's talking about why do the good die young? Why is it that uh, some people can strive and work and uphold the law and uh, maintain a sense of ethical integrity and never get anywhere or essentially seem to be punished for it? And uh, uh, whereas other people uh, do what um, is ill and seem to prosper, seem to thrive or even be honored and respected for what they do. Uh, aside from uh, other uh, rationalizations such as kalpas and different ages in which this is possible in either the Buddhistic or the Vedic sense, uh, there is simply that eternal cosm sense of the uh, Sephiroth and the Klepoth, uh, the higher and lower vibrations, where all of this is necessary for our universe to work. In other words, understand that for all that you like to see above the ground, those wonderful flowers in your garden, all of the blossoms, all of the uh, that which is above ground uh, that uh, you appreciate in terms of growth, uh, even that which you ultimately eat, the food that you harvest, the grain. Beneath all of that is a seething compost pile of carrion, and uh, it's based on the fecal matter of animals and humans, uh, and oftentimes manure is necessary for the growth of entire harvests that feed humankind. So without that shit, without all of those composting creatures, uh, whether they be worms or that which is far more malignant in nature, uh, that which is above the ground would not be produced. So think of those devils and demons and all the ill that they do as a natural part of the process of what is good in your world. Uh, all of this ultimately sources from the divine. 
uh, that which is evil, which rises up to claim you and pull you under. That is divine. All of this is divine. And understand that just because I'm saying what I say to put devils and demons in their ecosystemic perspective, their context of uh, what they do by being bad is ultimately good. Uh, understand that doesn't make it any safer to play with them. Uh, if you were to go outside in some field of manure or uh, uh, say, for instance, in a poor nation like North Korea, where they still use night soil, uh, human fecal matter in uh, their uh, attempt to uh, raise a harvest, uh, and this results, of course, in uh, the price they pay for that. Uh, North Korean escapees, uh, people who have managed to escape, uh, they've been found with very long intestinal worms inside of them. Whenever they manage to break into South Korea, the first thing the South Koreans must do is deworm them and make certain that they can free them of uh, what they've gained from the North Korean diet. Uh, if you were to go out and into a playground in a urban setting, where people are regularly taking their dogs to shit and uh, the children are let loose in there and they're playing around these playgrounds and they're exposed to this, they can get ringworm at the very least uh, or diseases serious enough to render them blind. You don't want to be playing with this sort of thing. So uh, just because devils and demons are doing good in the ultimate sense, it doesn't mean that they're your friend in the intimate sense or in the immediate sense. Uh, they are dangerous. Uh, they are dirty. Uh, they are, however, a necessary part of the ecosystem. And once you understand that and all the ills that befall good people, all of this is the book of Job. All of this is the divine uh, corrupting people and people who are good. Uh, there needs to be an amount of them that fall by the wayside, that ultimately get corrupted, because this is what feeds uh, the legions of the dam that ultimately are the compost that, and the carrion that help us thrive in the material world through the ecosystem of the creation. Uh, and there's always opportunity in those nether worlds, those lower regions for redemption, because ultimately it's all recycled. Just as the compost and the carrion die and the blossoms that are produced are comprised of uh, their organic matter, ultimately, uh, or at least their organic matter provides the nutrients, therefore, uh, so too uh, the, the damned ultimately recycle. And at some point, which must feel like an eternity to them, uh, they ascend. And um, that which is ascended also lowers oftentimes first by uh, materializing, becoming part of the material world, and then ultimately uh, incarnating in the bodily form. And um, the one thing I can tell you as a person who's died multiple times, I've suffered clinical deaths many a time in my life, and I've been dead uh, more than once. And uh, I can tell you from having seen both of those uh, vibratory levels of existence, that the afterlife in many ways, uh, certainly even if we think of the higher realms, is not necessarily all it's cracked up to be uh, from your perspective as a human being. In other words, it can get very boring to be in a state of eternal bliss or peace. Uh, this is why souls reincarnate. Uh, there are people in heaven who cannot wait to reincarnate. They want to come back here because uh, being eternally in Summerland, as the Spiritus used to call it back in the day, uh, the man who raised and guided me, uh, Chief Petty Officer of the United States Navy, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, he was a man who uh, was born in upstate New York. That's where originally the movement of spiritism started. And these were people who were trying to communicate with the dead. And uh, this was because so many people in World War I lost their children. Uh, and uh, it was after World War I that people said, oh my God, so many people had lost so many children that the movement of spiritism was born in which they tried seances to communicate with their lost children. And um, these people who were attempting that, it was the birth of a new religion. There are still, there's still a town in upstate New York where the majority of people are spiritists, practicing spiritists. And um, the reason I bring that up is not so that you join them or <laughs> feel the need to, I, I need to check into this, I want to find out about that. But, you know, all that's fine if you want to investigate that. Um, understand that uh, I've also heard people having negative experiences because if you try to talk with us, with the dead too much. Um, well, 
they come into you. Uh, and why? Because nothing beats being alive. <laughs> nothing really beats being able to uh, physically move yourself, uh, uh, eat, have sex, um, even void your bowels. <laughs> it's, these things are considered, uh, these are missed. These experiences are missed by people on the other side, believe me. Uh, so there are plenty of people on the other side, even at the higher vibra vibratory levels, who can't wait to get back here and incarnate again. Uh, so uh, you just understand that it's, it's in, in, and for people in the nether regions, it's not necessarily even punishments that are the worst. Um, it's actually missing what you had. The missing what you were able to experience, that can be the worst uh, that's down there. Perhaps even worse than whatever discomforts might be felt at the lower vibratory level. Um, so uh, hopefully that puts this into perspective because when we think of the anti-gods, of the cultists who ceaselessly attack myself, uh, whether it be in the chat or in the comment section, uh, understand that uh, they are not of this natural tree of life and death. These are people who worship the anti-gods that are extra dimensional, extra stellar, extra cosmic. They are outside of God's creation. These anti-gods are of what uh, is called Rasha, the tree of anti-life, the, uh, the anti-matter universe. And so these are the gods of the failed cosms prior our perfect creation. And even the devils and demons of our world would stand against them. Understand that. And in that sense, the devils and the demons truly are your friend, your ally. They count on one thing for their existence, you. Without your greed, without your sin, without your lust, without your vile, depraved predations that evolve in so many human beings, the devils and demons of the lower nether worlds, the husks of the Klepoth would not exist. So ultimately, they would protect you from those anti-gods of the tree of beyond death, the anti-life tree of Rosha. And so this is what uh, needs to be understood in terms of the cosmos that I've learned to deal with. Uh, I received a theological education the wrong way, in the same way I received a medical education the wrong way. Uh, received a medical education the wrong way by being a care provider and advocate for my parents in their declining years for over 11 years. And during that 11 year period, I uh, saw it all. When I, uh, of course, earlier before that, uh, was working with uh, the Dr. Colonel Michael Aquino. Uh, he, of course, was uh, a practicing Satanist originally and uh, later on became something far worse, uh, an Edomite, a cultist of the anti-gods. Uh, and uh, if anyone wonders at the nature of the anti-gods, a hint and nothing more, a flake, a hint, an illusion is provided by Howard Phillips Lovecraft when he speaks of Cthulhu and that pantheon. Those are the anti-gods of Edom. Uh, that is a pulp shadow of them, but it is all theologically true. It is mentioned in the Quran uh, that Cthulhu is the great forsaker. Uh, Shaitan is Al Cthulhu, the abandoner. Uh, understand that uh, this is quite real, has been recognized by uh, theologies and cosmologies and mythologies. Uh, for aeons uh, before recorded history and uh, their cults are alive and uh, more than anyone else uh, they seek to character assassinate myself uh, if they can assassinate my character they hope that no one will listen to me uh, but uh, understand what Howard Phillips Lovecraft himself said when he spoke in the shadow over Innsmouth that's his longest writ uh, the only uh, work published in his lifetime while he was alive, uh, that was in book form, 
He had short stories that were published in his lifetime, but that was the only novella published in hard print as a book, hard copy as a book, hard back cover uh, that was released. And The Shadow Over Innsmouth, within that uh, writ, that novella, Howard Phillips Lovecraft says, that elder sign which uh, holds the anti-gods away, which the only uh, sign which wards them uh, is, that's correct, the Hockenkreutz, the Hooked Cross, what his character says, what you would call a swastika nowadays. So uh, Zadok is the name of the character that says that. And uh, understand that this is why the Hockenkreutz is so heated and why there is a mass movement to eliminate it from appearing anywhere, because that way you are left without that ward. You are left without that ability to hold the anti-gods away. That is the death of the conspiracy. It is immense and it has been here for thousands of years and they're way ahead of you and they seek the ultimate destruction of all life in the universe. Uh, this is the true enemy. And uh, when it comes to that, what we need to begin to understand about these populations that our man Sean Bond has brought up, um, you know, these parasitic ones here, these these ones are kind of like cannibals and these ones kind of like, you know, uh, they exsanguinate you, you know, suck your blood dry. Uh, then there's these other ones that are kind of like, you know, psychic in nature. And, uh, you know, well, it, basically what we need to begin to do is disambiguate those that are part of this natural ecosystem and part of this cosmic order of 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 being and those that are unnatural those that are part of the servitor races of the anti-gods that are simply entropic so to put it in the further analogy for those who understood the parallel so far of that which is below the ground that you need all the ugliness down there all the shit the decaying uh, matter including carcasses and cadavers that are fed off by the gnats and the mealy worms and all of these other grotesque critters that you would never want to find on yourself when you wake up in the morning or worse yet inside yourself uh all of these things are necessary for that growth of that which is beautiful that you eat or that you appreciate for its aesthetics such as blossoms uh you've got that now that you've got that part how are they anti-gods analogous? They are like industrial effluvia. We're talking about industrial grade toxic waste that's not part of nature. It does nothing to add to the ecosystem. It can only destroy it or mutate it into hideous toxic uh, malformations that uh, do no good for the environment and do no good for you. That is the cult of the kings of Edom. That is the cult of the anti-gods. And that is what we must contend with as the ultimate enemy. My enemy is your enemy. And understand that because the attacks on myself will come as they do with every episode. They will come in the chat. They will come in the commentary. And it's your discernment that will save you. Now understand, this isn't a question of uh, damnation or salvation. This isn't a question of, uh, oh, I'm here to help you save your soul. Uh, what it is a question of is a total annihilation. Uh, if you are damned, as opposed to blessed or ascended, you're still a lucky human soul because the damned serve a purpose. The damned are in this cosmos for a reason. And of course, there is always the recycling, the redemption that will take place through the eons or what will feel like eternity to yourself. But if you become a servant of the anti-gods, all that awaits is annihilation of yourself. The nullity is what the cultists seek, a total annihilation which they feel is an escape from the wheel of samsara. Uh, this is a misunderstanding of what someone like a Buddhist would strive for, which is to ascend from the wheel of samsara to sever themselves from the suffering. And in the end, one thing you might notice is that these Buddhas, the people who do attain enlightenment and do become a bodhisattva, 
like a Roman Catholic saint, in the end, they always come back here to help others. So you're never really escaping, are you? You may be above the pettiness. You may be above uh, the sticks and stones or the words hurled against you. But the majority of the Buddhas uh, are either prayed to and then, in a sense, intervene inter indirectly, or they return to the material world to do what they can to help the rest of mankind strive for betterness. Uh, so, like a Roman Catholic saint, they're always watching over us. No one who's in the system ever really leaves. And that's fine. The system was created to persevere. But there are those who seek its destruction, and they feel that through that, they attain godhood. That if they can destroy the creation, then they are as unto gods. And hence, they serve the anti-gods. These are the worst of the worst. Understand your enemy. Now, who are your allies? There are more uh, than you know of because you are in a matrix where you feel that humanity is the only species left alive in terms of homo sapiens, that other hominids, that other humanoid races such as Neanderthalus, Homo Neanderthalus, uh, cro madney Man. So many of these primitive peoples, the recently discovered, comparatively recently discovered, Dragon Man. All of these various subspeciations, Homo Floriensis, the scientific hobbit, all of these subspeciations of humanity once existed side by side with people just like you and I or rather because I'm not really like you, I'm not really fully baseline human, being somewhat vampiroid myself, one fourth, uh, which we could go into more like Sean Bond in yourself. Uh, but when it comes to who you relate to, uh, you are essentially someone who would relate more to these extinct humans than you would to say the ghoul or various other subspeciations of really anthropoid species. They are human-like. And uh, yes, so go on. Uh, were you going to say something, Sean? Did you want to uh, provide some input there? Oh, I have a lot with everything you're saying, but I, I love your flow, so I, I feel bad breaking it. <laughs> oh, go ahead. But, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying, because, like, um, I mean, in the beginning, I was, like, a little distraught from it and, like, uh, afraid of the dark, but now I'm, like, oh, because I, I was integrating a lot um, of it. And it's good to do shadow work, other, otherwise you can't grow in it as, uh, it makes you resilient. And that everyone <clears throat> that's a human is, like, an angel and demon combined together, plus, like, a whole bunch of other species combined in our DNA record and a lot of other stuff. So we're like this super hybrid experiment that is beyond what most species here is viewing us as because they only get a little piece of the puzzle. And even then it's like uh, infinite potential. But uh, yeah, and I knew you, you had some uh, vamp uh, DNA in you too. Uh, so that's that was cool to get confirmation. Um, yeah, and uh, I also agree with your uh, uh, cosmology aspect with the tree of life, and I, I, I've I've tracked back that yeah, that's true. With uh, the the realms are related with each other um, in in uh, one like Sephiroth for the the body and the the fruit and the yeah uh, also the the ones for the earth as being a, her making a bunch of realms nine you know the nine main realms Yggdrasil plus the heavenly realms the the Quarantine realms and hell realms. I have actually a lot of experience with them. I, uh, I was one time thrown into a hell realm for like, uh, like compressed time for like thousands of year and it was torture, but, uh, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, but I, I, uh, learned a fuck ton and I had all that brought back with me very quickly. And, uh, it, it propelled me on my healing path quite a bit. Um, so I learned a whole uh, everything they used against me. The, there's apex, pre there's big predators in that that hell realm. Yes. Uh, so I had to learn, <laughs> learn while they were fracturing me apart and all that. I had to learn how to outperform them and eventually get my parts back. But uh, everything that they threw at me, I learned, including uh, the temporal uh, uh, in prison realm tech, how to manage prison realms, and then uh, th there's this. Uh, there's this cool thing to it because like earth uh 
she has a so like all these planets also have consciousness they're making a, a whole bunch of realms to to individually put different types of forms of life in each realm and uh because they can't all just interact with each other and they have different rules and some some of them are vacation realms this is not a vacation realm and then <laughs> <laughs> have different purposes. The quarantine realms are not always meant to be uh, like a, a hellish or a quarantine realm, but get invaded to the point where it has to become that. And then they quarantine a uh, bunch of negative species that are invading there because Earth, a, as an example, sees value in them and wants to graduate them through a process. Sometimes the hell realm gets sped up kind of like a Narnia thing uh, compared to the frame of time with this realm. And so they get graduated fast and then they run through to other realms and they, they go up the, the lava lamp of light and dark. So it's absolutely uh, beautiful and how the system works. And any demon that comes at me, because they come all the time and I, I have to remove them off people. Um, they're fractured beings. They're, they're abused. They aren't whole. They can't create their own light. They Either way, they forgot how or they never knew how. Their heart's been shut down. I learned all the different uh, systems of tech to bringing back their, oh, this is how I do it. Like as soon as they come, you, you'll feel that uh, most people that don't know that these exist, they will experience it as like big heart pressures, like drain of energy. They don't, the demons don't give a shit that you believe they exist. They, it doesn't matter at all. They, <laughs> they want you to not believe they exist so they can just drain off you. So yes. they'll be draining off them, causing pain Headaches, anxiety, stress, fear, uh, like you'll get nightmares and visions and all this kind of other stuff, depending on the influence they want. And then they'll add to the person's shadow, making them a obnoxious or bad person. Uh, and then like building that up as a harvesting thing. Or they could w drive a person to suicide, which is unfortunate. Um, there's all kinds of demons. But uh, I, uh, yeah, they're they're much better than anti gods, and I agree with you that I'd love to talk with you. I'm gonna do absolutely do that. Um, the, uh, this is how I treat them. Uh, so, like anything that builds up on a person's heart wall, let's make it simple. Uh, your goal is to make this flame in your heart that gets brighter, that will be like a, a compassionate, loving flame that encompasses, engulfs every one of those heart walls that builds up. The heart wall is like. Just imagine time you've been the most happy and expanded uh, in your life compared to any point that you are now. That's the difference. That's the heart wall. Those heart walls will be based on trauma, uh, trapped emotions, attachments, uh, entity attachment, limitation, all this kind of stuff. It will go back to a consciousness. I, I get up under it with loving detachment first, like pulses from the heart with each heartbeat. Uh, first, you want a loving detachment from it, uh, but with um, like care and treating it kind of like a baby bird. These these demons are younger than most of the humans here uh, in whatever uh, soul origin you want to go into. But, uh, you know, not everyone. Some of them are really ancient. Um, but like you, as an example, is ain't, are, <laughs> are ancient. So you can like see them as like children of the universe. And uh, you can get up under with love and detachment and like I do this bubble of no time that speeds up things, gets their wholeness back, remembering who they are, that I'm ultimately them, stop harming yourself, moral code, or, uh, like natural law, a bunch of things so that they take up on their own and take off like a baby bird and they don't see me as an enemy anymore. And then if they're really evil, then I'll, 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 I'll like put them into, I'll capture them, send them to a quarantine realm, and then I'll monitor their graduation so that they get uh, get through a process of becoming whole. And they eventually, you know, see me as non enemy because I don't like revenge seekers. But yeah, that's what I do. And it's very nice because, it, it, like, not everyone's, like, eventually after a while, you learn that no one's too far gone and every being has a purpose and every like they were not just a demon before like most of these spirits aren't just born demons they become them through trauma and uh, entanglement and uh, like i like that you individuated demons from devils because i also read that too as like one of these ancient overpowered species um but, yeah there's a lot but go ahead and continue 
No, that was wonderful, and I appreciate that profoundly. Uh, honestly, um, Sean Bond's experiences have been uh, profound um, and intense, and uh, he did bring up an ancient aspect of my personality. What he is referencing is, of course, that which is within myself, uh, aside from my genes, which is, of course, uh, Tabush Meliek, which is the peacock angel, and that was the result of the Night of the Broken Circle, and uh, John Bond might be familiar with that. If you are, sir, I'll ask you to recite what you know. Do you remember? Uh, you uh, you were like uh, document uh, doing document destruction, and these uh, satanic guys uh, did a, a pentagram circle to get like uh, night vision, and they made made it wrong to where the pentagram was open and then you felt the, the demon overtake the whole base and attach to you um, or whatever angel angel you want to talk about uh, it, it was it pissed off it pro uh, I would be um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, understand uh, that attaching to go on. I'm sorry go on, go on. Oh, oh sorry <laughs> no no by all um, means continue uh, it se seems like you made friends with it too right <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> that's, 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 no, thank you, Sean. No, no, you you remember quite a bit uh, to uh, contextualize that for everyone because that probably sounded. Uh, uh, that's like this is what happens when you get like fragments of uh, something that and it just comes out as really psychedelic and people just uh, you know say, wow, that's that's they got the colors. But they're not quite sure if the colors are part of a painting or not. <laughs> so I'll put that into within, within the frame uh, to reframe uh, what uh, Sean Bond remembers, which I'm impressed. He, he he's very familiar with the story and knows quite a bit. Uh, basically, when I was uh, working at night with document destruction in the incinerator at the Presidio military base, uh, and by the way, the entire story is available on the video titled Satan's Crusaders which is on my YouTube channel. You just go to the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel and uh, you will um, be able to hear the story. And um, so just briefly, uh, what happened was many officers who were members of Michael Aquino's coven um, decided that they were going to uh, play with magic. And uh, they had so much experience with Michael Aquino. Uh, they felt very confident, uh, hubris, incredible hubris. Uh, by that, I mean arrogance um stupidity uh and of course there's only so much blood you can shed in terms of uh, casting a spell because uh <laughs> there's not real uh, either that or you bleed out and you die right so you want to have enough blood left in yourself so that it's it's like basically the general rule is it's like you're making a donation at, at a blood drive if you're uh, contributing your own blood to a spell it helps to have more of you not just for the psychic connection all of you have and the energy you can focus, but also uh, because each one of you can donate a pint of blood. And, uh, you know, if there's 12 or 13 of you, it's as if you drained a full human being and uh, drained him dry uh, for an act of sacrifice. So uh, they were so arrogant in their overconfidence, so intoxicated, not just on alcohol, but their own overconfidence that they decided they were going to go for uh, one of the mother beings of them all, uh, the peacock angel, the, the earth angel, the angel of earth. So to understand that uh, there's an entire people whose lives are focused on the worship of the peacock angel from birth to death. And uh, these are an ethnic group, his people, the Yazidi. And the Yazidi are in Iraq. So understand this was one of the reasons for the invasion of Iraq. This was uh, to ultimately exterminate the Yazidi people. Uh, in terms of the Yazidi people, everyone in the Southwest Asia, when Americans call the Middle East, understands them to be devil worshippers. The worshippers of what Muslims feel to be Satan himself. And again, this is a more watered down or two dimensional mythology that has been subsumed into a major world religion. So in terms of Christianity, they had their own political reasons for turning gods into devils. 
Understand that the original god of the Europeans who were pagan, the original god of the Europeans, whether they were the descendants of the modern day or rather postmodern Wiccans or witches, or the descendants of the postmodern heathen or neo pagans, the original Europeans worshipped the horned god and the horned god of the Black Forest, of the Germanic and Teutonic peoples whom the Romans never conquered, whom the Romans uh, could only go so far into Germania. And uh, when they encountered the Germani tribes, the uh, Roman legions were defeated. Uh, and uh, this defeat was profound. They later on tried to avenge their defeat and expand it into Barbaria or the Germanic uh, regions of Europa, but they only got so far. And uh, to uh, put Germany in perspective for people, modern day Germany, think of a nation that's at the direct center of Europe, the true center of Europe, the heart of Europe, and it is divided in a sense uh, into four. It's divided into four in the sense vaguely reminiscent of the allied division of Europe in or Germania, Germany into four quarters after World War II. It's divided by history. And in terms of one aspect of history that people would be more familiar with, that would be the aspect of history of Germany divided by between East and West. The uh, that East and West division between what was formerly the German Democratic Republic or Communist East Germany and uh, the Federal Republic of Germany or West Germany, that Germany had the same division. They simply divided it along the same line as the division between Christian, the Christian Empire of Charlemagne, of the Holy Roman Empire, and that which was not Christianized. That was the original division of Germany East and West. Charlemagne was the original founding father of the European dynasties. And Charlemagne's descent was rationalized as a kingship. He held what was called the divine right of kings. And people hear that term and it's meaningless to people today. What does that mean, the divine right of kings? Uh, it's basically not simply a man saying force major which means rule by force, it means that he has come to rule over you because he is godly. Now, that doesn't mean he's just a Christian or a believer in God. It means via the, the Merovinian bloodline, he is a direct descendant of Christ himself. So when Christ actually married Mary Madeline, had a child, and this child was the father of kings in Europe, the kings of Europe were making their claim to divine right of kingship and married amongst each other to keep their bloodlines pure because their own belief was that they were descendants of the Godhead, of Christ. In, a, in other words, descendants of God. This means that they are like Heraclesian in nature. Hercules was half human, half divine, uh, the son of a human woman. I don't know. When what I track that? his DNA, yeah. his DNA got a lot, around a lot. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, Hercules, yeah, was was by that you're talking about how he spread his own seed around quite a bit, yes. Well, like, uh, not, not just him, but like his, uh, like, his closest descendants. Yeah, they had a bunch. Um, at least what I with what I track back. Yeah, but don't let me interrupt you. But yeah, I, yeah. I, re I read uh, a lot of demigod DNA lineages, and it's really fun because the, there's like authority and a mystery school with it, and a lot of uh, empowering stuff, and uh, like a direct line of communication. And they, usually, sometimes they'll know about the the deities will know about you when you're born, so it's like pretty interesting. Yeah. No. What's important about that is there is far more documentary evidence of Heracles, Hercules, than there is of Jesus Christ. There were far more people speaking of him when he was alive than people spracketh of the Christ when he was among us. Uh, Heracles was quite real and he was half human, half divine, as was the Christ. So in that sense, these lineages are divine. 
So when the kings were making their claim, uh, and the first among them as a European uh, identifying with that uh, peninsular, that super peninsular subcontinent. Europe's not really a continent. It is a subcontinent of Eurasia, uh, but it's super peninsular, meaning it is a peninsula with its own peninsulas. Uh, the Europeans were, before they were Europeans, were basically pagan tribes particularly dominated by the Germanics. And uh, Germany was divided in half by Charlemagne, who Christianized the Western half. The other uh, example predating that, that most people are unfamiliar with, was the division between North and South. Uh, most people, of course, uh, understand that Germany is predominantly Protestant. Uh, and this is what made Adolf Hitler so unusual, was because he was Roman Catholic, and that's because he was Austrian. And where was it that the German people of Austria became divided from the German people of Germany itself? Well, that's a kind of more nuanced uh, division. Basically, Austrians are German hillbillies. And uh, they were able to start their own empire, which was very Roman Catholic, and uh, go south. Uh, basically, what they had was considered at the time an Asian empire. Don't forget the Ottoman Empire of the Turks uh, thrust deep into Europe. So every inch of land the uh, Austrians won from the Turks was uh, basically Europeanizing Asian territory. So when it came to the other division, that subtle but no less uh, traumatic, the German form of intergenerational trauma that many indigenous Americans or black Americans suffer from. Uh, there's a division that the Romans created, the Rome that they conquered uh, into Bavaria, into the southern areas of Germany, was uh, walled off from the rest of free Germany by the Limes Wall. That Limes Wall was no less dividing than Hadrian's Wall in England. Oh, uh, though people know of Hadrian's Wall, most nobody knows of the Limes Wall. But that which was below the Limes Wall in Germany became Roman Catholic, and that which was above the Limes Wall became Protestant. So you have this division between Christian and pagan, a Protestant and Catholic in Germania, Germania being divided into those four quarters culturally. And the original god of the German peoples was the horned god uh, the Ororch of the Black Forest, and this was Wotan, and Woden, which became known in the Norse culture as Odin, uh, Woden was originally mm, as much animal as he was human, kind of a Greek type of satyr kind of perception, cloven hooves, uh, and uh, the great stag antlers that were a sign of his virility, and this horned god of the Black Forest, when the Roman Catholic Church conquered much of Europe, understand it was a process that took a thousand years. The original Christ uh, was roaming among us in the year one. Uh, we start the calendar based on his appearing among us. The Christian calendar starts with year one. And it wasn't until the year 1000 AD that the last European country, Scandinavia and Denmark, converted to Christianity. It took a thousand years for Europe to become Christendom. And that was the original identity that they held before they thought of themselves as European. And until that period of time, during that thousand years, the church was demonizing Wodan, Wotan, the god of the Black Forest. They used his image to project their Christian concept of a devil. Of course, the very word Satan comes from Sethen, the original god of the desert of Egypt, the god of plagues and pestilential foreigners and darkness, blood and war, the god who fought with Horus for Cairo. Cairo, the capital of Egypt, simply means place of battle. That was the great battle between Horus and Sethen where Sethen was defeated and expelled. That was the original Satan. Uh, yet Sethen, the original god that was this jackal-headed, diabolic entity, suddenly was Roman Catholicized in image 
uh, kind of like Disney, Disneyfying something, and they changed his physical manifestation, his visualization concept. They reconceptualized him as Votin, the god of the Black Forest, this satirical, as in satyr, this this goat uh, cloven hooved uh, entity with the stag antlers, uh, the very picture of virility and fertility. They changed, they said, that's the devil. And and of course, he's hung like a horse. Uh, and then that's sinful, too, because that's hypersexualized. Uh, so all of that is where your European image of the devil comes from. Uh, get rid of that. That's not uh, your enemy. Uh, so in that sense, when you think of this uh, diabolicization of uh, this entity uh, to propagandize on behalf of a religious church and the rise of the church was coincident with the decline of magic. Uh, magic was rife among the pagans and uh, the practice of magic declined and went underground and became the purview of the witches uh, whom the church then hunted down in a gynocide, a female genocide, a genocide of female practitioners of the craft. Uh, all of this is uh, needs to be put into perspective so that you better understand your cosmology. So when it comes to this uh, divine right of kingship, uh, where the kings were coming from, how your European culture was born, this division of Germany into the four quarters and uh, your better understanding of history, your ability to contextualize it, uh, so to understand that when it comes to uh, sacred symbols such as the Hockenkreuz, the Hooked Cross, the swastika, that was the original cross that Constantine of the Roman Empire saw in the heavens when he received the voice of God that told him under this sign conquer. That was the original Christian cross. When Constantine Christianized the Roman Empire, created Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire, it was the swastika that was the symbol of the Roman legions. It was the Hockenkreuz, the Hooked Cross. That is your original Christian cross. That is your ward against evil, the ward against the anti-gods. And uh, that was, of course, the warrior culture of the Romans that spread Christianity. Uh, Christianity was spread by war. So it is a warrior religion Understand that if you truly want to be a Christian and understand that you cannot be a true Christian unless you understand it as a warrior religion. So with that being stated, um, I'll tell you the truth. I really forget my original train of thought where I was trying to explain, uh, you know, the kind of quartering of Germany, a crucifixion of that nation into four quarters, the uh, difference between the Merovingian bloodline, the divine right of kings. We were talking about the genetic bloodlines. We were talking about um, uh, you can help me out here, Sean uh, Bond, and uh, help me free associate my way back on track. But uh, you can start by just telling us your own impressions of what I said and what it uh, reminds you of. And that probably help <laughs> oh yeah I, uh, I i watched a bunch of your interviews on uh the the deep secret history of, uh, and the cult of the nazis and i went uh one of the uh your information helped inspire me when i we we went to germany and uh we uh visited uh as a wardenshaft uh tower or whatever uh it's the mm -hmm. one with the the um Black Sun uh, yes, in the yes. bottom, and the, the guy did a bunch of rituals there. We went there and helped help because it seemed to be on a big ley line and a place of power. And it like, is. Uh, it, uh, we helped because because I, I also get contacted by Odin. He sends a bunch of like ravens and crows and stuff and when he it, like gives me messages. It's pretty nice. Um, uh, and I, I like uh, the the rep. Uh, Realm travel is one of my other fun things I like to activate with people, and a lot of people have like different species from the the realm, the nine primary realms they talk about. There's way more Earth has. She's like a really a magnificent creator of realms, but uh, also the other ones, uh, other planets make their realms, and they like to share them and uh, branch them off time, uh, off of each other, and they they can bilocate onto each other and then share and have like portal bleed over in. Uh, travel between them it's pretty interesting when, when like some of the realms are like in destruction or like I, I read a bunch of things in Sirius 
uh, went through dis- uh, the realms of Sirius A and, and B ha- went through a bunch of destruction. And then they uh, th- they adopted, well, they were adopting a bunch of species there. And then some of those species they adopted were highly targeted. And then, then a bunch of multidimensional predators followed them and then started doing destructions. And then they uh, brought them here. And a lot of the DNA that we have, you know, like I also know about your uh, your concept of a lot of the or, uh, um, ETs being origined here, which I, I agree because I uh, see a lot of time travel and a lot of them want to get in the beginning of the game here. And but uh, also I uh, go into like are there's some species that are older than this this universe uh, in concept. So uh, and Earth is also older and and so is your, your a, a lot most people I read human. Are older than this universe but uh, in spirit not yeah. there we are i um, remember my train of thought now thank you you can go on if you wish thank you <laughs> i'm glad you remember um yeah and then uh yeah i uh i loved uh you uh, going in the anti-gods versus the nor uh norse gods and i i wanted to go to germany to empower that i also found out there's a pyramid of germany uh dedicated towards hella the, the you know and and like there's some uh misinterpretations of history with her because she seems to be a nicer god in the original uh, um, t- uh iterations of her yes. uh, deity structure and like it goes along with uh, like a word holly and some other uh, uh like earth, an earth deity um and she was like worshiped and stuff and it was a nice pyramid um and uh, i went to some star forts and some other stuff but uh uh, oh yeah, the so I also agree with you on the um, anti-god stuff, which I'd I'd love to talk more on because they're the ones that are trying to stop us right now. So might as well expose them, um, and and we'll uh, I'll, I'll I'll team up with you for protection in this, uh, and uh, for those in the audience. Uh, the uh, when, so this is what I, I read as well with um, that. I read a whole bunch of dark sorcerers try to uh, do rituals to open up portals. Uh, and a lot, uh, most of the ones that are successful are usually through getting authority from uh, authority holders on this end of the realm and in uh, like whatever side they're trying to open up. I mostly have seen the ones that are open up now all around the earth connecting to hell realms. And they're like bleeding over as a way to for some of the de- uh, demons to like get through. And I'm not like against demons, un- like what you're per going to. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see them as a uh, necessary uh, necessary per- evil. person I'd rather have here than that. But they also get kind of like incurred and sometimes whispered into their ear and, and division is, is sowed. And so I I, I want to branch uh, the sides of light and dark, and uh, it's like uh, so, e- like e- um, darkness isn't evil, it, but it is easier, much easier manipulated into evil because it is not as likely to master moral code and the natural law, but if it does, it can, and it become like positive darkness. It's like a uh, unicycle on a type rope walk while g- dodging gale force winds, but you can do it, and it's wonderful if they do, because then you're very empowered, and balancing light and dark is a wonderful spectrum. Uh, there, evil seems to be perpetuating in like a monkey wrench and trying to pit us all uh, light and dark against each other uh, in a unnecessary way instead of like ever uh, expanding evolution. Uh, that like challenges each other like chess uh, players on the bo- uh, board to like uh, in- intensify growth beyond if we are not in some uh, if we are boring uh, like in the, the heaven realms but uh, not not to <laughs> put them down but like yeah I agree with you on that uh, <laughs> yeah they're they're mostly for like healing and if you want to make an amazing uh, place and a, a VIP club and like make creations and you if you want to generate super uh natural abilities and you don't want it to get fucked with that that's where you go um and then they try to uh flow a river of effect into the other realms to help them grow but in a safe space so it's like that safe space <laughs> yes thing. like it 
<laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the real game is being here because they don't have as much effect as if you're here. Um, and it, it's immensely uh, growing process if you're able to change or heal yourself in, uh, in a human body here. You can achieve a greater level of love than anywhere. Well, this is why I read one of the biggest purposes for uh, being a, in a human body in this realm. It's like we have all this genetic potential in an emotional body to experience a new level of love that's never been experienced before as beyond any potential of any species. Most be, uh, of us has never even gotten close to it, but we have the potential. Um, and it like love expands into every ability. Um, so it's pretty powerful to change everything. So, so um, yes. and, and yeah, thank you. Bless you. And uh, that's 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 beautiful as always, uh, Sean. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so when it came to uh, certain aspects of uh, what we were talking about, uh, Sean was bringing up uh, the uh, Velvetshire Castle. And uh, of course, uh, that is uh, Vevelsberg. And uh, in terms of Vevelsberg Castle of the SS, the Schutzstaffel, Heinrich Himmler's castle, where he, of course, had his own round table of the Knights of Black Camelot. Uh, these were, of course, the order of Die Schwarzen Corps, the Black Corps, uh, the knights consecrated by Adolf Hitler himself. And uh, Wevelsburg Castle was where Michael Aquino went in 1982 uh, and 83 uh, to conduct a ritual uh, overnight uh, from October 19th on my birthday Eve day into October 20th on my actual birthday. He did this so that he could not only in his objective bind myself, uh, but also try to prevent uh, the original old gods, uh, the elder gods, the Norse gods, uh, from returning into this realm, uh, instead uh, empowering his anti-gods. Uh, Michael Aquino was anti-Nazi uh, because he was antithetical to the swastika, the Hakenkreuz, and uh, all that holds the anti-gods at bay. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, entire uh, purpose of this kind of demonization, of certain gods understand that uh, this is the uh, way in which uh, churches uh, control and ultimately um, subdue or suppress uh, the religion which they are replacing. Uh, that's what happened with Tibetan Buddhism. The original gods of Tibet were not Buddhist. They were not Buddhistic at all. They were Bon of the Bon religion, the original uh, Mongolian religion. The religion of the Mongols uh, was Bon. And uh, so uh, I actually had the honor of meeting and dealing with uh, certain Mongols uh, in my lifetime. And uh, they were still practicing the Bon religion. And uh, that's spelled B-O-N. People can look that up. And uh, it is what the Tibetans, uh, Buddhists, violently suppress and uh, have uh, demonized. So when you take a look at Tibetan Buddhist art and you see those demons, those are really ancient gods of Bon uh, that have been demonized by the Tibetan church of the Dalai Lama. So they practice their own suppression of a religion uh, and then in turn are suppressed by the Chinese communists. Uh, there's something karmic in that, <laughs> but we won't go too deep into that irony. Uh, that being said, uh, when it comes to the uh, original gods that get suppressed and uh, Wevelsberg Castle and what Michael Aquino was doing, uh, this is what brings us back you, to- uh, You celebrate when he died? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Celebrate when he died. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> that's uh, you. Uh, you had to ask. <laughs> the the uh, first off, uh, yeah. I'll continue with what I'm going to say. I'll put put it this way. There, there. It was like barely a blip because uh, his his cult still functions in so many ways um and he is effectively still alive for all intents and purposes uh for those of you who don't understand 
uh, Michael Aquino, uh, and remind me to get back to the Peacock Angel. This is what I was trying to say with the comparison of Wotan and uh, the demonization of a god. Uh, the Peacock Angel is a god that is demonized, so they're therefore perceived to be Satan himself uh, by uh, the major world religion of Islam. Uh, so in terms of, we'll get back to that, but just a little thing about Michael Aquino here. He established the Temple of Set. He originally converted to Satanism. Now this was, I was born in the year 1966. Uh, in that year, 1966, on June 6, 1966, was when Star Trek was released as a syndicated franchise series in Canada. It was released in Canada before it was released in the United States. Most people don't know that. And that was on June 6, 1966. That's important because Gene Roddenberry was a big influence in my life personally, had actually spoken with me telephonically uh, with some extended conversations because he had a close connection with the Presidio Military Base Library. And uh, so, uh, he, of course, uh, had uh, created his character Spock independently, but uh, I very much relate to the character because Spock is, uh, of course, the character which originally Gene Roddenberry was trying to portray as an allegory for basically China, or rather free China. And uh, there's even in one of the original episodes uh, where uh, Captain Kirk and Spock go back in time, uh, that was uh, he, the gateway at the edge of forever or something like that was the name of that episode. And uh, it also stars um, that famous British accent, actress of Jewish descent. Uh, I can't remember her name now, uh, but she played in Dynasty uh, years later. Uh, my father had a crush on her. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, her in, being in that episode and all that, uh, Captain Kirk does say uh, that uh, trying to cover up for Spock's alienness, he says he's Chinese. He's, he's trying to tell the, uh, the, the, the police he's Chinese. But the reality is, for those who don't know, Spock's uh, Vulcan lineage, uh, most people do know this, was related to the Romulans. They're genetically indistinct. They're e ethnically the same, but they're divided by politics. And the Romulans were meant to represent communist China, and the Vulcans were meant to represent free China. And uh, they were supposed to be the original thrust of the entire series, that the main uh, adversary was supposed to be uh, the Romulans, because it was the Vulcan intervention for humanity that helped humanity progress beyond the barbarism it had descended into after atomic warfare and uh, recover a civilization to the point where it reached the stars all through the Vulcan intervention. So uh, the Vulcans basically save humanity and uh, they have their religion or their philosophy of logic called Kolonar that was basically based off Confucianism which is the state religion of Taiwan, the nation in which I was born. So this is uh, all part of Gene Roddenberry's own World War II experience when he was a bomber in the Pacific and had one time uh, been ordered to bomb Taiwan, the island on which I was born. And for those of you who don't know, don't take my word for it, look it up yourself. You can find that Taiwan, an island almost the size of Japan itself, was uh, known even in World War II as an unsinkable aircraft carrier. The majority of Japanese air power was uh, merging out of Taiwan. That was their major aero base. And yet the Americans throughout World War II, uh, for all intents and purposes, never bombed Taiwan. Uh, and uh, the reason why was the men who were sent to bomb Taiwan suffered what they said was hallucinations or uh, delusions that rendered them unfit for combat. Uh, basically, the men claimed that they saw a woman in the sky catching their bombs. Uh, therefore, very few of the bombs that were dropped even reached the ground of Taiwan. Uh, this woman was the guardian of Taiwan, Matsu, the goddess of the sea. And uh, so her protection of Taiwan was absolute. All of that continues through today. Uh, and so uh, Gene Roddenberry saw Matsu. He saw her catching the bombs his crew was dropping. He was one of the pilots, or the pilot, of the bomber crew that was attempting to bomb Taiwan. One of the few attempts. Uh, all of them were considered failures. 
and uh, the majority of the men were institutionalized. Uh, Gene Roddenberry escaped institutionalization by saying he didn't see her when all the other men claimed they did. And so he was rendered still fit for combat. That's how he uh, basically came through the war with his reputation intact. But he had seen something that changed his life, and that's why he created the character Spock, because he knew the spirit of the Taiwanese people, the free Chinese, and disambiguated them from the communists on the mainland via via the Romulans and the Vulcans. And he felt the Taiwanese would someday save America, and therefore portrayed the Vulcans as saving humanity. Uh, this is uh, something important, and of course, when it comes to uh, Vevelsberg Castle and uh, uh, Aquino's death, uh, let's just put it this way. Uh, it, around that time, 1966, that I was born, aside from Star Trek airing uh, as well, Michael Aquino within, uh, well, first, the man who started the first Church of Satan, the mages, Anton Zandor LaVey, a man of Jewish descent, decided he was going to take the philosophy of Ayn Rand, who herself was a Russian Jewess, and Ayn Rand was trying to create an atheistic capitalism that would be able to <coughs> defeat atheistic communism. Now, understand that, again, all communism itself sources from uh, Karl Marx, whose real name, and don't take my word for it, you can look this up yourself, was Moses Mordecai Levi. And so he was also uh, someone who had the uh, uh, rabbi is also a name, by the way. It's not just a a position. He also had the name of rabbi that was inserted as a fourth name at some point. But uh, with uh, Karl Marx changing his name for the sake of marketing, uh, which sounds rather anti-communist, but that's how he got the idea out. Uh, <laughs> geez, you OK there, Sean? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, if I if I do this, this is mostly because something is trying to Got it. Uh, stop us from talking about something, and I'm like, okay, I Got have it. to track down exactly what they want me to not talk about, and then talk about it. But don't mind. Uh, me. Uh, but by Go the ahead. way, just to reassure you, it does indicate we've got the red button up. It says Sean is recording the call, so we're recording. Yeah, just so everybody knows. And uh, we were concerned about that earlier. But uh, with uh, the rabbi Moses Mordecai Levi, uh, Karl Marx creating communism as an ideology uh, and Ayn Rand, whose family was devastated uh, financially and economically by communism, emigrating to the United States and creating objectivism, which is atheistic capitalism uh, that gets rid of all guilt, all sense of ethics, all sense of anything good or decent. She was creating what she thought was a ruthless capitalism that could beat communism because it got rid of a belief in God. So it was the um, Jewish individual named uh, Anton Zandor LaVey who took that philosophy and rendered it theological in nature. He combined it with magic and created modern Satanism, and he founded the first Church of Satan. But understand that the uh, Magus Anton Zandor LeVay, in taking the logical step from communism to objectivism to Satanism, he also was very much uh, protesting against the fact that churches were free of social responsibility in the sense that churches in America are not taxed. So uh, the Magus Anton Zandor LeVay was a proud taxpayer. He made certain that his church was recognized as a church, but nevertheless paid taxes. That being said, the first person uh, who converted to Satanism uh, that was really famous uh, was Michael Aquino. Uh, in terms of, well, you know, that's unfair. That's not true, really. Uh, Jane Mansfield was a Satanist. Sammy Davis Jr. was a Satanist. These were all people who converted to Anton Zandor LaVey's church, the first church of Satan in San Francisco. But, you know, Michael Aquino, he was the first one who really took it beyond just um, objectivist magic. And he said, I want to make something really serious with this. Uh, here's the difference. The major Anton Zandor LaVey said Satanism is uh, basically atheistic like Buddhism. For those of you who don't know 
Buddhism is not a religion originally. It's a philosophy. Uh, the original Buddha was a warrior of the Aryan caste of India, and he was a combat veteran who suffered from severe post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, as a man who had spent his life as a warrior killing, uh, the great Buddha himself suffered a multitude of assassination attempts until one of them finally succeeded in killing him. He actually was assassinated. So the great Buddha, the original Buddha, was telling people to give up a belief in the Vedic Hindu gods. He was advocating a peace without gods. This was originally an atheistic philosophy. It became religionized as it progressed throughout Asia. And by the time it reached the Far East, Buddha himself was a god. And then it was a, a formal religion. And then you believed in the Buddha as the god. And um, the other Buddhas were also gods. So sometimes men attain an apotheosis, meaning godhood, uh, after death like Caesar did. So when it comes to what I'm saying about Major Santon's Andor LeVay, he was saying Satanism was like Buddhism originally, a atheistic philosophical practice that you are practicing Satanism by believing in your own ability to attain godhood. There is no God and there is no Satan. Satan rather is a tulpa, a uh, basically a meme, a kind of thematic by which you render godhood within yourself by becoming Satan, becoming God. This is his philosophy. And Michael Aquino said, no, I want a theistic Satanism in which Satan is outside of me and someone I can pray to and bargain with. And so he formed the schismatic Temple of Seth, and the Temple of Seth being based on the original Sethen, Satan, of the ancient Egyptians. So when Michael Aquino did this, he also established pylons, as he called them, uh, in England. These are branch churches. That England was the easiest because of Aleister Crowley and the tradition of the Hellfire Club in England and the fact that they had once ruled a good part of the world and the seas uh, based on their satanic empire. Uh, and uh, they also took a nation and turned it into four quarters. They divided India into four by uh, growing the Great Hedge of India. For those of you who don't know, the English live in this horrible climate where it's very hard to grow anything, and yet they've become primary hedge cultivators. And the English hedgerows, when taken and transplanted in subtropical India, or rather fully tropical India, they basically mutate and become enormous. They become giant bramble bushes that are effectively impassable. For those of you who find this hard to believe, take a look at the Americans trying to invade France in uh, World War II. They encountered, and you can look this up yourself, what they called hedgerow hell, where General Erwin Rommel had ordered all of the troops prior D-Day for to prepare in-depth defense. And the in-depth defense that the troops uh, carried out was hollowing out hedgerows and basically placing machine gun nests within hedgerows. So they were perfectly camouflaged and firing out from hedgerows and that and other booby traps. Uh, it was very similar to Vietnam. The Americans were chewed to pieces. They lost far more men in depth in France amongst the hedgerows than they ever did at D-Day. And uh, this is why they developed tanks with these giant pitchfork uh, assemblies. You can look that up and their Shermans used these to uproot hedgerows. They were just using their tanks to uproot these hedgerows. Now that's in Europe. By the time you get down to India, these hedgerows grow to the size of walls. They are far taller than people and they mutate into uh, mutathorn bramble bushes that simply overrun the environment. So the British generated a great wall of India based on hedgerows 
that divided it into four quarters. They crucified the subcontinent, and therefore they could decide who got to eat, who got the food, who got deprived of it. This made it far easier to control the population and starve out an entire quarter of the subcontinent whenever they had to suppress rebellion. Uh, all of this uh, ultimately killed millions and millions of people. Over uh, the years of the Raj, 100 million Asian Indians died because of controlled British starvation in each of these quarters. And all of the sacrifice fed the Hellfire Club, which ran England. So they had a long tradition of Satanism and uh, their Satanism was taken advantage of by Michael Aquino, who established pylons of the Temple of Set in England. And all of this was something that uh, was the reason why J.K. Rowling's, who wrote Harry Potter, is a member of the Temple of Set, an acolyte of Michael Aquino. So Michael Aquino ultimately moved to England. He lived in Scotland. He lived in a castle in Scotland for years. And he personally was in communication with J.K. Rowling and J.K. Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter, that is simply a perversion of the original Asian Indian Vedic name, Hari, as in Hari Krishna, Putar. Hari Putar means the son of God. So Harry Potter is very real in its occult, magical formulary, in the sense that J.K. Rowling's got it straight from Michael Aquino. He was the occult advisor and consultant for Hari Puttar, the son of God. So in her book, she purposefully honors Michael Aquino through the character of Voldemort. And Voldemort, of course, when he dies, subdivides his soul into seven or eight entities to maintain his existence in the material realm. This is exactly what Michael Aquino has done. So Michael Aquino is still very much alive. He's simply inhabiting other bodies. This is what's called a horcrux in the Harry Potter, the son of God novels, the Harry Potter novels. And this horcrux uh, is a very real magical practice. So when Michael Aquino died, he didn't die at all. Uh, so there was no celebration on my part because, as I said, what's there to celebrate? Hence the role of the eyes. I hope that puts it in context now, my attitude. Um, and as we turn back towards the Yazidi people, uh, the demonization of uh, Tavush Maliek, uh, understand that uh, Tavush Maliek, the peacock angel, Lucifer is an ancient god that the divinity created to lord over the earth itself. He is a fell angel. He fell from heaven because of his pride. He would not bow towards man. When Lucifer, the bringer of light, the angel of light, would not bow towards man, and he fell to earth in his pride, he was essentially made the Lord of the earth. But the only way he could reign as Lord of the earth was to have his own people. And he created his own humans. If God can do it, so can I. The people he created were the Yazidi people. The Yazidi people are the people of the peacock angel. Therefore, if someone finds out about the Yazidi people and says, I'm impressed by the peacock angel, I'm overwhelmed by his beauty, uh, he has every right to be the proudest being on earth, and you wish to join, it doesn't work like that. You can't convert to the Luciferan religion of the Yazidi people. You have to be born into it. With myself, it was different. There are exceptions to every rule. And the exception was based on my possession by the peacock angel because of a group of arrogant drunkards uh, who decided that they were going to play with magic and were so intoxicated with what they had already learned that they felt that they could handle summoning 
the Peacock Angel himself. Now understand our man Sean Bond asked, was he pissed? Because I would be pissed. Understand this. They're always pissed. <laughs> Everything that's summoned is pissed. This is something that you as a human being must learn to understand. You don't know how lucky you are. As a human being, the only summonings you can ever get are from a court. And I know that can be bad. And you may never want to get those summonings. And that can be stressful, and that's its own problem. But compared to that, that's nothing compared to how you would feel if you suddenly were plucked out from your dimension and suddenly found yourself bound in a circle in some idiot's living room or garage or some abandoned basement or barracks or bunker, uh, and they're asking you to do something for them. How would you feel <laughs> to be plucked out of wherever you were at and then somebody wants something from you? There is nothing on earth that would probably piss you off more. This is why you're bound. This is why whatever is summoned has to be bound because whatever is summoned is going to be royally pissed. Uh, but as a human, you will never suffer that. You are one of the only entities in the cosmos that is immune to that horror. And for that, you can thank the gods for your incarnation as a mere human being. Everything else in terms of vibratory levels that are just a bit into the other world, just a bit between the veil that divides this world from theirs, is summonable. And people summon them and piss them off. So when you conduct a summoning, there has to be the binding. And of course, you want to contain that which you're summoning as if it were nuclear energy. Understand that what you're doing when you're operating a nuclear power plant, you've got this engine of immense power that you're containing because if that breaks loose, you're fucked and everything around you is fucked. That's what happens when you summon an entity of any power. Well, of any worthy power, uh, unless you're like doing something completely stupid and you're summoning imps or, you know, cosmic mosquitoes and shit, which is what most people wind up summoning because they're idiots and they don't know what they're doing and they're just playing with magic. And you get a kid and they're off, they're doing the Dungeons and Dragons bullshit and they're just like playing around. This is usually what comes at them. Yeah, they're lucky. That is just that. And this is because they're not sacrificing a human being or let alone a worthy human being. Uh, they're just like maybe killing a cat or something. That's bad. Don't don't do that. <laughs> or they're killing rats or something. And, you know, that's even if they get that far. Uh, but what these men did was they took their own blood, each one of them a pint, and there were 12 of them. And each one of them took a pint and contributed it to the cause. And they drew a blood circle to contain their summoning of the peacock angel, Tavush Meliek. And so they decided that they wanted to be able to see in the dark as a uh, predator of the night uh, so that they could uh, test out these new silencers. There were some brand spanking new silencers that were made for automatic weapons for the military by Department of Defense contract. For those of you who don't know, back in the battle days, and it's still the case today in many cases, uh, silencers were a one-shot deal. It was basically, you had a silencer and one bullet goes through it and that basically blows all the baffles inside the silencer. So you get one shot and it basically, it's usually after that you throw away the silencer and you might have a series of silencers if you're trying to fire several shots, but you know, can imagine the problem of screwing that on. Uh, there's still no such thing as a silencer for shotguns until recently someone finally designed a silencer for a shotgun but i believe again it's one use and disposable in the old days trying to sil silence a shotgun they would make something out of paper mache and it was good for only one shot but when it comes to uh shotguns for an automatic weapon that's extremely advanced and in those days didn't exist until there was this department of defense contract it existed after that but until that point, they had some of the first of these things. 
they wanted to test them out and they wanted to do it at night so they decided lo let's be able to see in the dark let's summon the peacock angel himself to give us this ability so when they summoned him i was uh, working the incinerator and that's when the world around me changed and the world inside me changed uh the incinerator is incredibly hot uh, you can imagine and of course you're sweating you're grimy and you don't want to go near the flames other than as close as you can get to shove in the documents uh, that you're working with the crates etc uh i began to realize i wasn't feeling any heat even though the incinerator was on full blast but uh, i really felt cold suddenly i felt very cold the cold that i felt was the cold you feel when you get a blood transfusion from a frozen plasma bag that's just been defrosted and you get the cold blood coming in you and it hurts like a bitch it is burning in its coldness. It is excruciatingly painful. Uh, I felt like that through my entire body, that cold burn. And I felt no longer able to empathize. Probably the most painful thing of all was the hole in my soul where I could no longer, like our man Sean Bond there with his cat, if you feel that warmth of that cat, you respond to it with a human warmth. You respond to it with a human empathy. You sense and you respond. If that cat had jumped on my shoulders at that time, I would have felt none of its warmth and I would have had none of the response of empathy that is evoked by that warmth. Am I, am I coherent? You understand what I'm saying? All, right. All of yeah, that I, was I, gone. There's more stuff with the, the demon. It's like a. For me, it was like, uh, I don't know, in like Harry Potter, you reference as an example, but the mentors and the like uh, ice coming in and forming and getting me to forget everything around me to, that would empower me. It felt like a void and like a fire inside me was being hushed out. My ability to create love and all that was being hushed out and then eventually like overwhelm and uh, like torturous pain. But yeah, um, do, uh, do you, uh, st oh, and uh, my cat would just freak out and hiss at me at the time. Uh, so, yes. uh, yeah. At, um, at they, that they time, yes. Cool. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. Cool. you were still, uh, do you, did you get your empathy back? I got the majority of it back. I, there, something was, you know, as I said, if people want the full story, you can see it at Satan's Crusaders on my own YouTube channel, Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel. Uh, but, uh, what happened was something was forever taken from me. Uh, it could have been a happy memory. It could have been, uh, basically the, uh, fact that, uh, we had a, uh, something that made me more fully capable of communing with other humans. Something, something was forever taken. There is always that gap, that hole in my heart. Uh, but at the same time, something was emplaced in its place and that was an element of the peacock angel that will forever be there this is why when i visited iraq and this was in 1980 oh god 88 uh in 1988 i spent my summer vacation uh in the first gulf war for those of you who don't get it uh americans have no concept of fucking history. They All they think of is what's American is history. And so they use the terms Gulf War I and what, Gulf War II, and that's bullshit. Uh, the, the Operation Desert Storm, which I participated in, was Gulf War fucking two. It was not the first Gulf War. The first Gulf War was the Iran-Iraq conflict that lasted eight fucking years. So the original Gulf War was something that I was a part of in its last year, uh, the Iran-Iraq conflict, as a propagandist. And uh, that was because the Iraqis were recruiting commercial illustrators uh, to conduct a propaganda campaign for them uh, so that they could uh, appeal to the West and have the West understand that they were fighting on behalf of the West, that they were saving the West's ass from the fundamentalist Iranians who wanted to overrun all of Southwest Asia. And at that time, 
Saddam Hussein was the great defender of the West. He wanted the world to understand this. I never met him personally, but I was flown by the Iraqis through the Iraqi consulate in San Francisco on contract uh, during my summer vacation and uh, helped at that point to bring an end, in a sense, to the Gulf conflict at that time, Gulf War I. Uh, I later participated in Operation Desert Storm, Gulf War II, and of course, the Gulf War that was the invasion of Iraq itself, that was the third Gulf War, that's Gulf War III. Uh, so if you wanna look at it as a purely American experience, you would say Bush War I and Bush War II, Operation Desert Storm being the war of Bush the senior, and the invasion of Iraq being the war of Bush the junior, Bush War One and Bush War Two. if you want to disambiguate it from a purely Amerocentric perspective. But uh, such being said, uh, the uh, when I was in Iraq, aside from so much else that I saw there, I visited the Yazidi people, the worshippers of Satan, as the Muslims view them. So to the Muslims, the peacock angel is Satan, is because he's Lucifer. But that's a conflation of two very separate entities. And the reality that Luc is that Lucifer is the fell angel, the earth angel, the Lord of this realm, and uh, God is the Lord of the heavens, but Lucifer rules the earth. Uh, and uh, his people are the Azidi, and uh, the Satan is the fell angel who fell further than Lucifer, fell further than most into the pit. So when you uh, come to the concept of Lucifer, the peacock angel, uh, understand that he is, in a very real sense, everyone's God, kind of, is he's the God of this earth. Uh, and earth, just so people understand it, is from the Germanic goddess uh, Erde. Erde was the mother of Thor. And she was the daughter of Nath, the daughter of Night. She was the mother of Donar, the original German name for what became anglicized as Thor. So Earth is the only planet in our solar system named after a non-Greco-Roman deity. All other planets in our solar system are named after Greco-Roman deities. If we were to use that same Latinization of Greek gods that is used to name the rest of the planets, such as Venus instead of Aphrodite, Mars instead of Ares, uh, Mercury instead of Hermes, then Earth would be named Tellus, T-E-L-L-U-S, and everyone on Earth would be not an Earthling, but a Tellurian. But we don't use that. Because Earth is Midgard, it is man's home, Mannheim. And Earth is therefore the only planet in the solar system named after a Germanic goddess, the Earth Titaness, rather than a Greco-Roman divinity as all the other planets are. Very important. So in that sense, we're all Earthlings. When it comes to Mother Earth and the Peacock Angel, his people are the Yazidi, but when I showed up among them, visiting them while I was propagandizing for Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War, the Yazidi people accepted me as one of their own because they sensed Tavush Maliek, the peacock angel in myself. Uh, they even offered me one of their daughter's hand in marriage, which I did not take. Uh, she was legally underage, not that that would have stopped me, but <laughs> all of that being said, uh, it was just, I didn't, was not ready for marriage or, uh, but, um, aside from that, I, it, it would have entailed, uh, so many other responsibilities. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, the reason why was they could foresee their own tribulations in the future that with the fall of Saddam Hussein, that their problems were just beginning. Uh, they could foresee his fall and they could foresee ultimately ISIS. And in ISIS was created, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Michael Aquino wrote the book Mind War. And when he wrote the book Mind War, 
about psychological warfare. He, the man who wrote the preface to that book, uh, the man who wrote the preface to it, was also its secret co-author, was General Paul Vilele, who was a co-religionist, a fellow Satanist of the Temple of Satan. And Paul Vilele has gone on record to say, I created ISIS. General Paul Vallely created ISIS specifically to exterminate the Yazidi people. And the logic was that if they killed the Yazidi people, exterminated the race of the peacock angel, Tavush Maliek, that he would lose his tether and all of Earth would be unbalanced and fall into chaos. Uh, all of this was their intent. And for those of you who don't understand the true evil of these worshippers of the Edomites, the anti-gods, the kings of Edom, then you don't understand the nature of what we're fighting. So Tavush Maliek, the peacock angel, Lucifer, the god of this world, is on your side. The Yazidi people must be protected at all costs. They have suffered enormously throughout their existence. One of the most persecuted peoples on earth. Their god is demonized into shaitan, Satan, by the Muslims. In the sense that the Roman Catholic Church has demonized, Satanized, Wotan, the god of the black forest of the original German peoples. So... That's the track that I had lost, but I regained it, <laughs> regained it thanks to our circuitous uh, adventures together with uh, Sean Bond. Uh, tell you what, Sean, give me a short break. I'll suck some tea here while you take over for a bit and share some of your wisdom in regard to that. With uh... right, I'll take a break, too. We'll, we'll use the restroom and all that. Okay, so, right, Joe, so we'll, we'll stop recording for about um, how many minutes you want to give? Five, yeah. ten minutes? How much? <laughs> yeah sure uh 10 minutes is fine 10 minutes yeah. okay. okay so all right so let's give it a break well, whenever, for 10 if we all, yeah Sorry? if we both get back as well if we both yeah, get when we back, both get back well. is when we start again okay yeah well it's um uh, it's 5 22 p.m right now so we'll be back about 5 30 ish you know okay about 8 30 your time